start us recording. And um, hey, um, um, Mindy and and Greg, you know, as you guys know, I did a um, a, a, a couple days of a, a very focused mastermind with a number of financial advisors last week, and um, you know, several um, several people that we uh, work with here and there, and and uh, work with uh, common people. And um, uh, one of the things that um, really was discussed, is, you know, let me give you an example of one of the advisors who really has a good systemized process for generating new clients and um, uh, a, a couple of things that needed to be tweaked, by the way. But it may, maybe step back. One of, the, one of the questions I ask all of them is, um, I said, what do you perceive to be the number one problem that advisors have? And what we uh, what we what we see in the marketing that goes on everywhere is, you know, people are promising to fill up advisors calendar. Right. That's what you know, there's all these A.I. systems and different marketing systems and one thing or another. But would I rather have a relatively calm calendar with uh, with three or four new heavy hitters a week? Or would I rather have a, a, a full calendar with broke people? Well, you know, what we what we what we all know is what we'd like to have is a full calendar of highly qualified prospects that are coming through. And with uh, with the advisors that we work with directly, uh, um, Mindy, we had this conversation Tuesday uh, uh, with our gang in uh, San Diego is very rarely do advisors think about pre-qualifying their leads before they spend a lot of time with them, right? So so what what they were doing is having a, uh, you know, a 15-minute conversation to get an appointment that turned into an hour conversation. And in the hour conversation, figuring out if they were uh, uh, qualified enough to work with or not. And then without having, you know, money coming in yet, uh, what they were doing is uh, giving them a checklist of stuff and doing an awful lot more free work uh, before ever finding out if they were going to become a client or pay them. But so, you know, I mean, the bottom line is we want to avoid that. Right. right. Um, but going back to that conversation uh, from last week is one of the advisors, um, you know, their very systematized process. And um, Greg, you'll appreciate this is basically heavy duty advertising on Facebook, other social media, um, that then drives people to register for a webinar. And then the webinar is a pre-recorded webinar, but it's not on demand. So in other words, uh, let's say that the webinar is presented as being at, uh, at noon on Wednesday. So it's presented as here's a live meeting uh, that you can come to to discuss, uh, you know, and we'll talk about topics, but, you know, this topic. And so what she has done is created a webinar live that, has done a good job of converting people to appointments. So all of her marketing, including her email list, when they opt in, drives them to register to a once a month webinar. I mean, a once a week webinar. The webinar each week is the same webinar, uh, but it's what we might call a pretend live webinar. And then the webinar drives them to make an appointment. So they schedule their own appointment and that drives them onto her calendar. And she's driving plenty, plenty of qualified people every week onto her quali onto her calendar uh, from those uh, uh, from that process. Now, I made at least a couple of suggestions to her for fixing the process. What would what would you add if you got if you got that process and it's doing a good job of filling your calendar, Greg? What would you see immediately that you might uh, uh, suggest tweaking? Well, well, the what I would suggest tweaking is making sure that the there's a pre um, a pre appointment setting uh, process. You know, I mean, there's nothing pre appointment. She's banking on the one shot appointment setting at the at the, at the webinar. You know that that always seems to be the flaw in these processes that the that the idea that the webinar is going to sell them on setting the appointment rather than some sort of individual call. If the idea is that you've got qualified prospects coming in the front end of the uh, of the of the funnel, yeah. Well, and 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 I've had that conversation multiple times in the last seven days, which yeah. is there needs to be a human being in between. Before the person whose time is worth $1,000 or $2,000 an hour, 
ends up chewing up an hour with somebody who's not going to be a good fit. Right. So what, uh, what I'm taking from what you're saying is the gap between the webinar and her actually talking to somebody, there needs to be a human being inserted in the middle to pre-qualify that person, run them through a couple more steps. Now, the conversation was the people she was talking to had already jumped through a number of hoops, so therefore they were qualified. And what we've seen for ourselves, for our other businesses, for our own businesses and for other um, uh, advisors, is the person who jumps through a lot of hoops means they're interested in the subject, doesn't mean they're capable of investing a million dollars with you for uh, an AUM, you know, uh, fee-based management uh, system. Um, now, what we've diagnosed for a lot of people before is what happens to the registrations of people who complete the form and don't attend the webinar? What happens with them? And in this case, what I just illustrated was what they do is they go, if, if I understand correctly what, what she told me and what, 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 what my suggestions were, she puts them all into a, an email list, does a good job of them getting a daily email, very personality-based, not formal, not sounding like it's from a, you know, from a big company, but from an individual, but does not do much otherwise with a follow-up of people who registered from the, at the time they register. Uh, she's using only the people who show uh, for making appointments. So let's go through and diagnose what we would do differently. Mindy, you're on the on the front end of that. What well, what would we do differently on that? Well, a couple of things. One is you know making sure that they've gotten when they opt in to begin with that we contact them immediately to start with that we're making that first connection right away. Um, through a text, a phone call, and an email right then um, when we first get their information and then following it up. And then, of course, you have the uh, rule of they're not opted out until they tell us to, um, how shall we say politely, bugger off or they mm -hmm. die. So, you know, they stay in a loop so that we're continually following up with them. Yeah. 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 So, so. In in, in um, uh, what we find with almost everybody is they think in terms of, and of course, advisors tend to be very centric about everything's a referral, right? But I get a name, I follow up with them for a week or two or three weeks. If they respond, they get on my calendar. They're a, you know, they're a great prospect. If they don't respond, they don't get on my calendar immediately. They give up to, on them and then, and then uh, go to somebody else. So that's the last part of what you were saying, right? Which is, and, and she's doing a good job of that, by the way, um, that example I was using of they're getting an email from her every day until they, you know, um, opt out, uh, which would be, you know, your version of, they tell you to bug her off, um, but they opt out or otherwise and end up off of her list. But what we, we always try to do, and I see this as very unusual uh, with even fairly big firms is the outbound call. If there is an outbound call seems to be done by somebody whose time is, you know, the most valuable in the firm, not done by uh, uh, somebody who can do a good job of building rapport, building relationship and, and inserting themselves in the middle. Uh, Mindy, you know, uh, you know, quite well with us, you know, nobody gets to me personally until they've jumped through like four hoops, right? At um, least. You know, at least. So it's always there's a qualification at the opt in. And, and by the way, a, a, you know, both Fisher and Smart Advisor, uh, it, it, you know, there's a lot that I don't like about Smart Advisor. One of the things they do well is they jump through, jump people through a bunch of hoops on the qualification process. So by the time that you have a lead come in, you know, you know, how old they are, how much assets they have, what their what their goals and objectives are and so forth. So does Fisher. Fisher does a really good job of asking a series of questions along the process. Um, I see most advisors don't even do that. But then uh, we always recommend put a live human being in the middle to follow up immediately. And uh, um, Greg, I think what is typical of you know, especially the internet marketing types is they are real focused on getting a lead and do a really crappy job of converting leads to a, a, a live prospect 
and do a crappy job of of pre-qualifying those leads in the process. Well, they're one shot. They're one. Uh, they're focused on just one media. So the 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 idea of somebody calling them ahead of time, or the idea of getting their mailing address and then following up with some direct mail when they're a potentially really valuable prospect is is just seems foreign to them. You know, what do you mean sending mail? And we've we've told people that uh, we've told advisors that had a really great list, including mailing address. Well, you know, those people are already pre-qualified. Why don't you send them something in the mail? They think we're, you know, crazy or we got, uh, you know, corn growing out of our ears. It, it, it's a logical next step. But there's more media than just Facebook or more media than just LinkedIn or more media than just using email. And to not take advantage of those multiple sources is crazy, especially when you look at, uh, you know, like you said, this advisor you were talking to, she's following up with email. But, you know, if you have a deliverability rate of 25 percent, 30 percent with email and it's only going to get worse, you're in pretty good shape. In fact, it, it, it started getting a lot worse on the first of the year. Yeah, exactly. Google and Yahoo just released uh, 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 more strict uh, qualifications for, we don't need to get into the technical terms, but um, a couple different uh, uh, more filters came out that um, Gmail and Yahoo emails won't get delivered if those aren't dealt with. And many, many, many of your software programs are not going to deal with them properly if they're not handled really well, uh, just expect that those aren't going to be done right. So your deliverability is going to go way down. So if you think that uh, email is the panacea and it's going to handle all your follow-up marketing, you're, you're missing out. So it's, it's just so common that on the front end and the back end, nothing's getting handled well. Oh yeah, absolutely. But, but let's, let's start with, you know, all the good things about analyzing the system that, that I'm talking about is what, everybody needs is a process where you just turn the crank and you keep turning the crank and it's generating leads, generating a, an ability to sort the wheat from the chaff. And then you need a follow-up system in place where you're converting those leads to appointments. And in this case, the lead magnet, if you will, is a live meeting, a webinar, and then the attendance of the webinar is basically a pitch to schedule an appointment. And then the appointment is a pre-qualification step and a, uh, uh, an opportunity for a sale. Um, and again, the criticism I have of it is I would do a lot more um, separating and qualifying the lead coming in, even if I got fewer leads coming in, and I would put a follow-up system the minute the lead came in rather than waiting for the webinar. And then I would put a human being in between the webinar and the actual uh, appointment and perhaps even before the webinar, which is what Mindy was saying, so that you can sort out, you know, this half of the leads are not people that I should spend an hour talking to. And, you know, and, and again, before anybody gets offended, you know, what we're talking about is it doesn't matter what, what, the, what the person's status is, we're going to give them valuable information. We're going to treat them well. We're going to give them something that they take away uh, from it, whether it's mailing them a book, emailing them a PDF of a book, giving them an ability to participate in a live interaction, uh, a, a webinar interaction, whatever it might be. We're going to give them valuable information. So the reason they gave us the contact information and the content that they're getting by email and otherwise is going to be valuable for them. So it's not like we're, you know, baiting them in and not giving them valuable information. However, you know, like in our own lead funnels, I only want to talk to one out of 10 of the ones we're getting in uh, because our expectation, our standard and what it is, uh, the people who are going to benefit most from what we're doing. And frankly, the people who are going to be able to uh, afford to work with us at that level are the top 10 percent. They're not the bottom 90 percent. And that's and there's no no shame in that the bottom 90 percent. We're going to give them tons of free information and tons of uh, of support. We're just not going to invest my time and invest uh much uh, time beyond that initial call of our staff on on working with them. Um, well, and that and the, and hopefully we get the ninety percent into the top ten percent. That's totally yeah. okay too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and keep them in the in the pipeline. Keep them where we're dripping on them. Keep them uh, where we're educating them, so that when they do get to that point, uh, that they're gonna they're gonna go through it. And one of the conversations we were having 
all runs together. I think it was on Tuesday with a you know very successful advisory firm is making the decision on who you want to work with, right? Do you want to work with only people who have, let's say, a million dollars or up in current assets? Or uh, do you want to, I, I, I keep coming back to the references. It's been a while since I read it, but the million and next door references is, do you want to work with somebody who's a high income, low assets person to turn them into somebody with, with high assets that you're managing? And how do you want to you know, develop the fees and so forth? So it really does take some thought on who is it you want to work with, what are the various scenarios that might turn out to be a really good client, and how do you want your fee uh, uh, situation to be? You know, if I'm an advisor and I get somebody with with high income, low assets, you know, they may not click my button on they have uh, whatever the number is. I'm gonna let me use the number a million uh, for me to manage. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bring in ten thousand a year from managing their uh, direct assets, but they might be able to pay me 5,000 initially, and they might be able to, you know, uh, uh, pull off 20% of their income uh, for the foreseeable future that I can build that assets up. So I've got to make an informed decision. Let's go back to the webinar um, uh, structure and, and, and details though, is probably, I won't say probably, definitely, the best possible way to get a good conversion from a webinar is you're doing it at this day and time and it's live and you're interactive with the people who are involved, right? You're asking them questions. They're answering whether the questions is in a discussion forum or the questions are you've got them all on video and you're interacting. As you guys know, I like to do it where everybody's on video, even if there's, you know, 50 or hundred people and we're asking them questions, interacting and so forth. But that's the bet, you know, that's the best scenario. On the other end of the spectrum, what you see a lot, and again, not to be hypercritical, but a lot of the internet marketing types, you know, what they'll have is they'll have a pretend live webinar. And maybe it's I register for a webinar and then I immediately, you know, dump you into the video. Or when I register, it's obvious what's going on because the registration form will say starts in, you know. Uh, one that starts in 10 minutes, one that's tonight, one that's tomorrow morning. And it's obvious that that's not going to be a live webinar. What we're seeing with people who are getting the best results from webinar is it's either it's this day and time promoted for two or three weeks and people register and it's live. Or in the case I, I mentioned, and it's working great for her, is she recorded one live that was very good but then all the leads, there's one that's promoted each week, but it's on a given day and time. It's not on demand. It's not landed on the on the landing page. It's not, you know, such a fake live thing that it seems obvious that it's fake. So it's on, let's say, Wednesday at noon or Wednesday at 6 p.m. or whatever you want to want to do. It's on a, a specific day and time. People register for that one at the specific day and time. And then if somebody doesn't show up for it, you can make a decision. Do I provide them the recording? Seems like that's not the ideal way to do it. Or do I say, you know, we're sorry you missed this one. There's a, uh, there's going to be another one next week at this day and time if you'd like to attend. And with the processes we talked about, either way, we're going to follow up with them the minute the registration comes in. Anything to pick up on that, uh, Greg or Mindy? No, I mean, the, the missing piece is, is that there's so many opportunities on the pipeline from lead or or generating the lead to closing that it, it's just incredible that there's there's so much leaky parts in the pipeline that we can just clean up. Yeah. And um it's it's really is frankly pretty surprising that that this isn't getting picked up better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and, and uh, you've said it um uh, slightly differently which is um you know, what, what happens is there's so much sloppiness on their percentages that oftentimes we can take something that they're doing right now and go from uh, uh, maybe 10 times the results with a few minor tweaks, right? And, um, um, you know, generally the industry doesn't value somebody registered for an event doesn't matter doesn't matter whether it's a steak dinner at a steakhouse or whether it's a webinar mostly the, the only sales pitch if you will is when they show up live 
So that's a huge mistake. The other mistake is I get up on stage, whether it's metaphorically or whatever, where I get up and I'm talking, and then I say, if you'd like to move forward, go talk to this person. That's a huge mistake, right? So what we want to do is on anything they're doing, look at it and say, well, here's one way you can 90%, you know, uh, make a, a 100% or a 300% or a 500% improvement. Here's another way you can make a three to 500% improvement. Here's another way you can make a three to 500% improvement. Well, and, and, and that validates why we can get a 10 to, you know, 10 times better results. Uh, sometimes that, you know, just going to somebody going to a webinar, the webinar example is a great one. Some, somebody just going to a webinar is, yeah, it's okay. I mean, but to to do the the pre-work that we're talking about can can swamp out your results that people would get at the webinar. Yeah. And, and frequently, you know, you, you do a webinar and what happens if you have internet problems? Right. You, you know, the w webinar, it's just like a live event. You have a live event. Which just, I've had a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> our own, our own events. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And and what about like a live event? You have a live event, and it's this time of year in certain parts of the country, and you get blizzard out. That you don't, you know, in Denver, you don't have that if many. It, if problems, it had been but, Monday in Denver, we would have been in bad shape. Right, right, exactly. So you you know the it it. But if you had done the other pieces, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a waste. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It, it's mind blowing, really, when you think about it. How how much. Uh, how much the miss, how many missing things are happening. Yeah. 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 And let's, let, let, let's go through kind of the A to Z. Let's go back to, to brass tacks here a little bit. So if I'm doing a webinar, um, there's any number of ways to get people registered for the webinar. Um, but in general, number one would be your own list. So every lead that you've generated for however long you've been doing it, offering it to your email list, a, a good friend of mine, I just got a, a postcard. I'm on his list uh, where he was sending everybody on his list. A, in fact, it was one of those, uh, you know, note cards. So fold out, had all the details and so forth. But everybody on his list was getting a note card, inviting them to the webinar. So, you know, starting one is everybody you have on your list. And we could subset that of everybody who's a current client. I would always start with anything that I'm doing is designed around up prospects. I'm going to let all my current clients know that this is a opportunity to bring a friend. Again, doesn't matter whether it's a steak dinner at a restaurant, a meeting at your conference room, at your office, uh, something at the library or the local community college, or if it's a, an online event, I'm going to let all of them know that here's an event that would be a wonderful to invite friends who fit this criteria. Right. Um, so you've got your own email list. You've got your own list of clients that you can communicate with by email, by text, by direct mail. You've got your own prospect list that you can communicate with email, text, direct mail, retargeting on all social media, retargeting on Google. Um, the second way that we see uh, promoted is obviously paid ads on social media and organic social media. The difference between organic and paid ads is mostly just reach and and how many people are going to see it, right? So I can buy ads and get a million people to see the ad. I can I can post stuff on my page and maybe 40 or 50 people see it. So it's to the extent that we're going to put targeted budget in that we're going to get people to, uh, to be there. What we've done a lot uh, with um, more recently is also creating an event in LinkedIn. And then you can go invite all your connections to that. Um, the really good thing about that is you can get an awful, awful lot of people who are respond. You get their email addresses in your system and so forth. I will say you create an event in your Facebook page and invite people. You create an event in LinkedIn and invite people. There's a very low commitment level to somebody saying, yes, I'm attending and click yes on the box. So the, uh, the show rate uh, tends to be really low on those two sources. But what you do is you create a a, a good list. What would you guys add to that? Well, yeah, I mean, there's lots of ways that, that people are completely missing using those lists. And we say, well, what about the people that you've, um, uh, we, we had one advisor, uh, I think you'll know who I'm talking about, he had, a, you know, 20 years of people that he, were actual clients, that were actual clients and not and just he, one it's, it's it's about it's about all of them 
Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, actual clients he had talked to in all these years and, yeah. you know, sold policies or sold, you know, it, it, they were investing with them and, and hadn't talked to them or, you know, sent them reports or sent them notifications. And, and the idea would be to, in, you know, why don't you invite them to the webinar that you're going to do? Well, oh, okay. Well, I'd have to pull that data. I'd have to it'd take an hour. You know, they're on his list. There is his broker dealer has them. Uh, and and because he hadn't communicated with them for that long, then it was foreign, a foreign concept to get those people uh in in his in his rhythm of marketing to so that they might, you know, if they're 20 years ago, now they're retirement age. And that was a specialty at that at that yeah. time is you know, but well, they weren't let, retirement age 20 years before. Yeah. yeah and let, let's define that. So let, let's say I'm an advisor and I sell annuities <laughs> and I sell life policies uh, and I also do fee-based fee management. Well, just because I sold somebody a, uh, uh, well, what happens is the mindset becomes, I made a sale with somebody 10 years ago and they have what they need and I don't need to follow up. The um, uh, David Ogilvy, the great book, uh, Ogilvy on advertising, if Anybody who's seen the the show Mad Men, you know, some portion of that show was based on David Ogilvy. Um, but his line was, "You're not advertising to a standing army; you're just advertising to a moving parade of humanity." And what you're what you're expressing there, uh, Greg, is the fact that anybody I've come in contact with that I had a good um, interaction with, I should be staying on their list, right? And you know, a, 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 another book that I loved was uh, Joe Girard, um, the, uh, you know, the Guinness Book of World Records car salesman. Well, yeah. you know, one of the things that he was known for is everybody he sold a car to, you know, went on his mailing list and they got a, a card from him every month for, you know, until they died or, uh, you know, um, uh, got returned unfordable. Um, and the key was what he knew is, you know, everybody's itch cycle was, I think he is, is, is uh, uh, logic was three years. So the average person he sold a car to was going to be in the market in, you know, three years. I've had realtors who I bought, you know, I, and I tend to stay put for quite a while, but, you know, they kept me on their list for forever, which is right, right? They should, um, if you know what the average cycle is of somebody getting, getting more engaged with an advisor, if I've got a new client who's fee-based and I'm meeting with them, you know, once or twice a year, and I'm um, really staying in communication with them, great. But if I have somebody I sold an annuity to, or I sold a life policy to, what I should be doing is constantly communicating with those people. Because number one, the day I talk to them, their financial condition may change. One of them that was a referral from us, um, you know, what, what we know is, uh, you know, when they talked to them the first time, there wasn't much to do there. They sold them a life policy. And seven months later, they had a death in the family, inherited a ton of money. And if there hadn't been a constant communication and a constant uh, awareness, you know, they could have gone anywhere else or, you know, they could have done what most people do with found money is, uh, you know, blow it all and, and not end up with a good investment uh, strategy. So anybody you've interacted with on what felt like a one-time transaction they should constantly be on your mind. They should, and I don't mean you're personally uh, interacting with them much, but they should constantly be getting dripped on by email and by direct mail and and so forth. So you never want to take your eye off that ball and 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 try to get those people back in your loop. Yeah, and for the most part, the uh, there's this narrow mindset. I sold them a life policy, so I'm not talking about uh, you know investments or I've, I I did annuity, so I'm not talking to them about something else. When years go by. Years go by, and it it should be it needs to be part of the normal process that we are looking at their entire portfolio, their entire situation, and it, it just is not common. And it's not it, a lot of times. It's not the advisor's fault. It's not taught in the industry. Oh, it's, absolutely. Yeah, it seems like that's a that's an unusual piece that uh, uh, and. You know, for some of you guys that work with, I know some of our guys are working with um, uh, people that have, um, uh, uh, you know, either their company or they're working for 
the military or they're working with people that work in the military or with a with a with an organization that has some sort of policy or some very specialty things like in the fire in the fire department or whatever they may have the mindset that that's what they're investing in or their pension plan or their their whatever plan they have and and there's lots of other opportunities that may they may need to focus on or other things that they need to to work with and and to revisit that or what happens when they transition into retirement out of those jobs that they can focus on um there there's a lot of opportunities and you're not doing them a disservice by talking to them about it you're in the example you just gave, somebody dies and leaves them a bunch of money. You're, that was a win-win for both the advisor and the the client because, you know, you're right. If the money just sits in the bank and sits around somewhere, either a it doesn't make it goes into money, a new Corvette, new Rolex, or yeah, or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of things that come up in the world, or they use it on uh, medical expenses that they would have had in a better place. They would have had a yeah. I mean, there's so many things that can come up that just eat up all that money. Yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, back to the mechanics, I, you know, sometimes we talk about this stuff and people just don't know where, where to start. And so what I'd want to do is create a traffic source. In other words, create a way to get people to go to an, a registration page, fill out the registration page. When I'm filling out the registration page, in my mind, the, the mistake that most people make is they just ask for a name and a email address or they or they don't even ask for a name nowadays and just get an email address. We tend to make opt-in forms that are going to be more complicated, either multi-step or more information. The argument against that is that fewer people are going to fill out the form. The argument for it is, why do I want to waste my time with them if I don't know enough information about whether they're a qualified prospect or not, and if they're not willing to uh, to share some of those details. So that's that's the challenge. As far as a platform for the webinar, there's any number of them. We use Zoom and Demio, um, and there's pluses and minuses either side. I shifted us from Zoom to Demio, and there's a lot of of, of selling points to it. I kind of like Zoom as well, but. Uh, uh, but most of the platforms that you can use to create, and there's Ever Webinar, there's what Webinar Ninja, there's you know any any number of them. Um, but most of the platforms will let you create a landing page. In other words, a, a little simple form for somebody to register. Once somebody fills out that form and register, most of the platforms will let you pre-design a series of follow-ups that will remind people, you know, give them the login information, remind them day and time. Um, remind them to show up. Most of them will also let you uh, create a follow-up for people who don't show up. Um, what we typically do is we tie that information from Demio or Zoom into our CRM so we can overlay more follow-up, text messaging, direct mail, and so forth, right? But the, the, the first part is creating a landing page where they register, setting up the webinar on the platform and let's say Demio or Zoom, having a topic that is interesting enough that people are going to uh, uh, to register for it, and then setting up a follow-up system so that one, people are likely to uh, show up, but also creating a follow-up system where they end up in your prospect database. They're getting contact from you forever, uh, meaning daily emails or three times a week emails, direct mail, et cetera, but also designed to then move them to the next qualification step and to an appointment. Uh, what what else would you add to that as far as the setup? So you're, you're setting up at least three emails, preferably some text and so forth to get them to show up. Um, hopefully you have a live human being talking to them, data mining and encouraging them to show up for the event. What we would always do is throw in some direct mail in between. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I would throw in some direct mail and, and and it can be fun direct mail. It can be something interesting. If you've written a book or you've written a white paper that has some authority building component on the subject. Um, some of the guys that we've worked with have written books and, and they have co content that would, that would distinguish you. Cause one of the pieces that we, we really haven't touched on, but it is important is why are you different from the other, you know, thousands and thousands of advisors out there? What makes you 
what makes you special and why should they listen to you? And if that can be pre-framed before the webinar or during the process, when the when the information when we're even setting an appointment before the the if the live human being talks to them and if somebody's pre-qualified, they can set an appointment right then. So that process, if if it's included in like a book or a, a white paper that's sent to them, and now a pre-call goes out and that person that's doing the pre-call sets an appointment. For, to somebody that's pre-qualified, then you're already going to be looked at as somebody that's important because you've written a book or they've they've gotten a, a you know a taste of what your content is from a from a, a white paper. A lot of times people think that's very daunting that that's very hard to do, but it's very very easy to do. Yeah, yeah. At least it's simple. You know, the steps are are simple to follow and put together. Um, the um, um, something you said there, uh, I want I want to pull back for everybody for a second. The objection will be when we say something beyond email is that that costs money, right? Now, let me, you know, let, let, let me explain. And, and we spend a fortune on, on stuff like that, right? I mean, if we get a qualified prospect, we're going to probably, you know, spend a hundred dollars on them in, in mail and so forth. But the difference there is if all I had was like an email address or I had an email address and a mailing address, and I don't know anything about them. You know, I don't want to send a, you know, spend a bunch of money on a, a kid who's in Pakistan, you know, filling out forms or, uh, you know, some bot that's, uh, you know, spamming websites. But if I have good qualifying information that they have provided, then, you know, and then sometimes they lie to you, sometimes it's not accurate, but most of the time, is it's fairly easy to tell if they went through the form and they tell me how much assets do they have available, what their income is, what their objectives are, how far they are from retirement age, let's say. Um, and I have a good mailing address, email address, and phone number. Well, if somebody fits into my criteria, so let's take the number I've been using. They got a million dollars in investable assets. Well, 1% of that is uh, is 10000 a year. You know, we know that year over year advisors tend to, once they get a client, they tend to have them for a long time. So that client is going to be worth at least a hundred thousand over their lifetime of their involvement, maybe 200,000 before we start talking about adding additional family members, um, you know, a multi-generational uh, management of funds before we start talking about referrals, you know, one good quality client. They may be worth to the advisor, what, a quarter million, 300,000, 400,000 or more, depending upon what their assets are up front. Shouldn't I be willing to invest if I if I'm going to close one out of three or or uh, uh, one out of or even two out of 10? Wouldn't it be worth investing quite a bit to really impress them and to stay in front of them and and so forth? So, see, I think oftentimes that's the the piece that people miss is. You know, I'm not going to willy nilly send out a, a ten dollar package uh, or even a one dollar postcard without knowing a little bit about somebody. But the value of the sale for a qualified prospect is so high that I should be willing to invest up front. And by the way, if people do it the way we tell them to do, their revenue almost immediately is going to liquidate all of their costs on getting somebody in, plus be very highly profitable, much less what happens for the rest of the year, much less what happens over, over a period of two or three years. So I think sometimes that's the piece that they're missing, right? Is you want to know a little bit more about them and then you want to make, make a decision on whether they're worth spending money on. And, and we'll have clicks within our system of here's somebody we're going to send a big box, a physical book, you know, a, a whole series of other stuff. Here's somebody we're going to send some postcards to Here's somebody we're going to put on the email list and we're going to follow up with that, but we're really not going to invest much time and money otherwise. Yeah. And the, the most realistic thing we get asked a lot of times, well, how much money should we spend on marketing? And, you know, th that's the way to answer that is what your lifetime value of a, of a new person is uh, a new client. And, and that isn't that hard to calculate. No. And, and <clears throat> a lot of times people have a really weird, point of view on that or they don't really they don't they, they're not understanding the way that you just went through it that's really critical to understand one new client can be worth ten twenty thousand dollars so it doesn't mean you want to spend five thousand dollars getting a new client but to spend a few hundred bucks 
really isn't that big a deal. Yeah. But well, if I had to... if I had somebody again, I'll I'll stick with my my million number. If I have somebody and I, I bring them in uh, for a meeting and then they write me a check for five thousand for a planning fee, and then they end up with me managing their assets, um, it's going to be a ten thousand dollar a year account in likelihood for uh, any number of years. And likely that account is going to grow both because they put more money into it and uh, uh, just because I'm going to do a good job managing it for them. Right. So the value grows year over year over year. So, you know, that, that that's that's a, a lot of income and the way the way you then back into what you're willing to um, pay for a lead, pay for an appointment, pay for a, a, a new client is you work your way backwards from there. You know, and and what I always start with is what did last year look like? How much revenue did I do? How many new clients did I bring in? Divide those numbers in, and that gives me a likely lifetime revenue per person, assuming nothing else changes to improve, right? But that, that at least gives me a starting point. And then I can say, if this is what a, a new client is worth, what's, an, uh, what's a, a meeting worth? What's an appointment worth? what's a lead worth, right? And then I can back it down to how much is a qualified lead worth versus an unqualified lead. Well, an unqualified lead may not be worth much, but how much am I willing to pay for a qualified lead? You know, we just had this meeting with one of our people who does uh, LinkedIn and uh, and Facebook agency work for us. And, you know, they'll tell, well, here's this, how much a lead is. It's like, well, I don't really care how much a lead is. I care how much a qualified lead is. How much is a qualified lead? Um, and so, you know, all the others were just kind of discarding and saying, you know, the whatever percentage it is is qualified. Here's what we're willing to pay based upon we know this is the conversion rate to appointment. This is the conversion rate to meeting. This is the conversion rate to new client. And the average new client is worth X amount. It gets kind of complicated thinking about it, but it really is a pretty, a very simple calculation that hardly anybody has done. And, and then, you know, the answer to that question, how much you just yeah. spend on marketing. And I, I think we end up getting people when they don't know. Well, of course, the natural reaction is not to spend very much because you're you're then tentative and, and timid about what you should spend. And you think that, you know, I'm not getting a return. I'm not getting results. Well, there's two problems. One is uh, you're uncomfortable spending money. The second is, is you don't know how to do it correctly. But in this case that we're talking about, webinar is a good example, but there's many, many other things that we, we can be doing some work on. Uh, you're missing out on all these opportunities down the pipeline that would give you, not exaggerating, 10 to 20, 30 times the results because you're you're missing very, very productive uh, pieces along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let, let, let's 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 stop it there. And um, uh, Carlos, any and all questions and updates you have, let me let me give you a chance to pop back in. 